You're watching Meet the Poet. My name is Flory Crass, and today on Meet the Poet, I'm joined by Henry Normal. A lighthouse serves little purpose during the day other than to wait, though I know somewhere on this misnamed earth there are always ships out to sea, still in the dark. Now, you might know of Henry from having produced a series of legendary British sitcoms like Gavin and Stacey, Alan Partridge and The Mighty Boosh, which he did with Steve Coogan under their Baby Cow Productions company. But he has many strings to his bow when Henry is also a brilliant poet. Uh, he co-created the Nottingham Poetry Festival and he created the Manchester Poetry Festival. And today we're chatting to him about his poetry, all revolving around ideas of the home. So stick around, I think you're going to really enjoy this. Please like, comment and subscribe. Follow us on socials at Homestage Poetry on Insta, TikTok and Twitter. And sign up to our poetry mailing list to be kept up to date with all poetry needs at Homestage. Now on with the show. Henry, welcome to Meet the Poet. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Uh, well, um, I, I've got a, a broken arm, but apart from that, I'm absolutely fine. So th <laughs> thanks for inviting me. You're a real trooper for joining me today with your arm, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I think let's jump straight in and hear the first poem that we have planned from you today. So this is The House Is Not The Same Since You Left. That's right. So uh, uh, this is a poem I wrote in my uh, late 20s. The house is not the same since you left. The cooker is angry. It blames me. The TV tries desperately to stay busy, but occasionally I catch it staring out of the window. The washing up's feeling sorry for itself again. It just sits there saying, what's the point? What's the point? The curtains count the days. Nothing in the house will talk to me. I think your armchair's dead. The kettle tried to comfort me at first, but you know what its attention spans like. I've not told the plants yet. They still think you're on holiday. The bathroom misses you. I hardly see it these days. It still can't believe you didn't take it with you. The bedroom won't even look at me. Since you left, it keeps his eyes closed. All it wants to do is sleep, remembering better times, trying to lose itself in dreams. It seems it's taken the easy way out, but at night I hear the pillows, weeping into the sheets. Thank you, Henry. A beautiful uh, first reading. Um, as you said, this is from um, quite a while ago. We've got uh, a little variety of poems to hear from you today. Um, and so let's get to know you and your background um, first. So you're a poet, but also you're a writer for TV and film. You have so much experience. Um, what got you into writing as a career in the first place? Well, um, when I was uh, about uh, 11, I was very gregarious um, and uh, didn't really sort of take much interest in books, but my mum died in a car accident. So I became quite withdrawn and I started reading books, um, mostly comedy books. But then I came across a, a book by Spike Milligan called Small Dreams of a Scorpion, which was a poetry book. And I thought it might be a funny poetry book, but it was serious and it made me cry. And I, I was so impressed by a man who was so funny and yet he could make you cry. Um, so from then onwards, that was about 14 at the time, from then onwards, um, that's really um, what I've been looking uh, to do. So both uh, in radio and in television, um, a lot of the programmes that um, I've been involved with are um, programmes that seek a sort of a truth um, and that can be both funny and uh, uh, moving. Mm. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, finding the truth in it. Um, and I see this in your poetry as well, how at times there is this, this comic element comes in, but it's it's so honest um, and searching. I mean, so, I mean, you mentioned TV stuff, your production company, Baby Cow Productions, which you ran with Steve Coogan. You produced some cracking shows. I mean, Gavin and Stacey, Mighty Boosh, Alan Partridge, so many things. What is your, your best or your favorite writing experience to date, would you say? <laughs> well, I do like doing the poems, and, uh, and when I retired from TV and film, um, I went back to the to the poetry. Um, there's something about the direct communication of a poem mm. that it's it's not pulled this way and that way. You, you take a film like Philomena, 
uh, there's over 300 people. So everybody is pulling it one way or another. And, and they can make a difference. So um, something like makeup and uh, um, the props and uh, the costume, they all add to your vision of it. Whereas with a, a poem, it's entirely what's in the poet's mind mm. being put forward to what's in your mind. Uh, and I love the... Um, the simplicity of that, but also the uh, um, the the authenticity of that's probably the nearest we're going to get to understanding somebody else's perception of the world. Mm. I mean, because also you must be really used to having your writing performed and performed by other people. How do you find that with your poetry? Do you do you feel quite personal about it in that you only want to read it, or do you feel that it's sort of thing actually often you quite like to keep, leave it on the page what's your approach with that uh, i i like to think that uh, each poem you write uh, is connected to you but is something separate and uh, it could be a good poem or a bad poem it doesn't mean you're a bad poet or a good poet it just means that you that's what you've come up with um I, i'm a big fan of uh, uh, ozymandias uh, uh, and um obviously he's not around to read that poem uh, so we all read it in our own uh, voices. And uh, it would be lovely to think that um, something that you've uh, perceived and, and you've recorded uh, can travel the world, uh, can travel through time in a way that you can't. Mm, I love that. Um, OK, I think maybe let's hear another poem. Um, I think the next one we have planned is Cuckmere Haven. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've I'm got a, a theme of home uh, in this because my next radio show, I do a radio show for about uh, every 10 months and the next one is home. So at the moment I'm toying with the, the idea of home. So I live on the south coast and uh, this is um, a place called Cookmere Avon where, where probably my ashes will be scattered. And um, it's a lovely place that we go quite often. So Cookmere Avon. Sun stripes the seven sisters like a barcode. The sea and sky are sketched with the same pen. Buttercups and daisies lie scattered like coins loose on your dresser. A lighthouse serves little purpose during the day other than to wait. Though I know somewhere on this misnamed earth there are always ships out to sea still in the dark. Oh, gorgeous. I love that line somewhere on this misnamed earth and that sort of powerful statement on its own about home and how we've labeled something that well, well, there's, more, there's more sea than there is earth uh, exactly yeah so we, we should be calling it sea really rather than earth um, yeah uh, but I, I i like the fact that we give something a name and then we think we understand it uh whereas yeah. we don't i mean um i did a program about the universe and what i found um was that um the majority of the universe we don't know and we just give it names you know we, we say dark matter no idea what it is we, we just give it a name and, and then we feel like we know something about it yeah it might not even be dark it, you know it's just just a name that we've given it to to, to so as we can we can talk about it mm. in some ways that's kind of what i think poetry is and what poets want to do is they want to put things to they want to put them into words and give it all a name to help understand it a bit better. I don't know if you'd well, agree with that. Well, I, I think most of my poems are a conversation with myself. Mm. Uh, I think first and foremost, it's about trying to understand the world and trying to understand what the, the significance of, the, uh, of what you're seeing is to you and you're placing it. Uh, and then really everybody else eavesdrops. But you would hope that you're not that different from everybody else, that, that we can all get something from everybody else's perception. Mm. It's, I, yeah, I completely understand that. And I would completely agree. Um, I mean, so you said that we've talked about this, how the poems that you've got today are very much about an idea of the home. And that is obviously very personal to you. I mean, why do you think this theme comes up in your writing so much? Um, well, I, I, it's like a lot of these uh, the concepts, they're all linked. I mean, love is linked uh, uh, and uh, the universe is linked and uh, communities. They're, they're, all the, the ones I've done, they're all linked in some way. And, and I, what I, the conclusion I've come to uh, at the moment 
uh, I'm still exploring it, is that um, Ohm is not a place. Uh, I mean, I've, I've cited a place here, Cookmerhaven, because um, my brother's ashes are in Cookmerhaven, and that's where I think I'm going to be. So in, in a sense, uh, it has some significance to me. That, that particular place. It's a beautiful place. Mm. Uh, and we go there and I've got some good memories of it. But it's only um, you that decide that that is a particular place. And it's only because of relationships. So if my brother's ashes were there, and if I, uh, I wasn't going to end up there, and probably my wife ended up there as well, um, then it wouldn't have the same significance. So in, in a way, um, what I'm, the conclusion I'm coming to is, is that, that OM is about your feelings and it's about feeling uh, accepted, feeling um, uh, that you don't want to be anywhere else, uh, feeling that um, in some way you are present mm. and in the moment and that that is where you should be. And I, 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 I'm a good friend of uh, Lem Sisse, and Le Lem was brought up uh, in uh, various um, uh, sort of institutions when he was a, a kid. So sometimes when I'm thinking about home, I, I think about what his idea of home is. Uh, and because so many people have different ideas, you know, uh, some people have homes that, they, that, you know, they don't want to go back to the family. They have no interest in their family. Um, but for them, they'll have an idea of home. So I, I think it's something very personal to you and it's something about the way you feel in a particular place. Yes, and that, that sort of plays in really interesting, interestingly with your poetry when you say it's a conversation with yourself that you hope other people can eavesdrop in, into. It's, this is your home and people can probably see some parallels with themselves, but it's such a personal thing and so dependent on you and your experiences. Yeah, I think we're all searching for the same things. Um, when when you're younger, you, uh, you you probably like to feel that there's um, there's some um, immediate gratification uh, with the things around you. But uh, uh, certainly for me, even at the age of eleven, having lost my mum, the 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 idea that there's something beyond that we have to strive for, uh, and that we that we try to touch has always been something that's lived with me. Um, I, I've, I've met, um, through the television work and the film work, I've met hundreds of creative people. And what I've found is that every one of them, at some point, has felt um, dislocated from the world, uh, usually in childhood or in the teenage. Um, and, and they've not felt like they're at the centre of things. They've, they've, they've stood back and they've looked at the world and thought, how does this work and, uh, and how do I get in? You know, you know when you see Glastonbury and everybody's dancing in Glastonbury, mm. they're all jumping up and down. There's no writers jumping yeah. up and down. All the writers are on the side going, what's this about? That's so interesting. I love that. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, there was um, someone that I had on Meet the Poet before, I think this was Sue Hubbard, she said how she thinks that every poet, um, I can't remember her exact words, but that every poet is searching for a home and that they every poet feels lost in a way. Um, I, 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 I think, I think uh, uh, shall we say, the poet in all of us yeah. feels lost. Uh, um, uh, it's just probably with some people, it, it's more upfront in their mind and more upfront in their world. Um, and uh, had my mum not died, maybe I'd have become a greengrocer uh, and um, I'd, I'd not thought about it. Mm. That's so interesting. Um, I think let's head to your next poem. Um, okay. We have The Jar of Joy. We have lined up. Jar of Joy. So, so my wife, uh, uh, Angela, uh, um, she has a jar uh, that um, when something joyful happens, she, she writes a little note down and she puts it into the jar and then uh, uh, Christmas or New Year, she, she'll open it up and, and read it and remember. And I love the fact that, um, I, I love the fact that not only does she accept there may be joy, but she plans for it. It's yeah. quite nice, isn't it? So I, I thought so it's such a little, and in terms of a, um, a title. Uh, obviously, the word jar can mean uh, a jar you keep things in, but also a you know a, um, 
uh, are pushing against. So um, this is called the jar of joy. No amount of sugar can preserve it. Euphoric surge, unscheduled, unable to sustain. Freak weather within the soul. A guest that's always welcome, but seldom turns up. Giving back control to the cosmos for but a breath. Unsettled by an overwhelming gratitude for being. Momentarily in love with the old bloody mess. The perfect wave in a restless surf. A sudden realisation of possibility. Optimism made tangible for an instant. A fresh breeze through an open heart. Thank you. I have to say, I've tried so many times to to do the same thing, have my own jar of joy. And I really mm -hmm. admire your wife that she keeps at it and manages to actually fill it up because I get to maybe a month into the year and I forget that it exists. You see, my, my thank you. You see, my, uh, my, my poem is really trying to define what that joy is mm. uh, um, because it's such a, it's such a difficult thing to define. Um, so whereas my wife is tangibly involved in it and recognises it and, and that, um, I'm still to the side trying to understand it. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I, I, um, I, I read uh, uh, um, Freud's jokes in their relation to the unconscious uh, when I was uh, about 20. And um, it's, it's quite a big book. There's a lot in it. Um, but what I took away from it is that uh, the way humour works is that you uh, you put an image into somebody's mind and then uh, with brevity you twist the image and the person realises that the first image in, in their mind has consequences and uh, you laugh because of your um, imperfection at not understanding those consequences. Oh. So if you think of uh, um, uh, any joke, a, 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 a man goes into a shop and he says, um, I'd like to buy a wasp. Uh, and, and the shopkeeper says, we, we, we don't sell wasps. Hmm. And he says, well, you've got one in the window. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, the, 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 say the, the, it's about twisting your, your, yeah. the, the images and your, and your uh, understanding of the consequences. And, and, and so what I took from that uh, at the age of 20 is, uh, and, and, and it's, it's very similar with poetry, is the humour is coming to terms with imperfection. And we laugh at our own imperfection. And when we do it together, it's a very uh, cathartic thing for us to laugh at our own imperfection. And I think poetry has got a similar sort of thing that the world is imperfect and we're trying to understand the imperfection and our own imperfection. And I think also with this idea of twisting images, it lends itself to a level of absurdity, which fits in with poetry quite a lot because often poetry feels quite absurd and it feels really different to real life and these strange images and concepts. And that's Although uh, real life's quite, uh, is quite weird. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, yesterday I could do cartwheels. To, to, today I can't put my pants on. Yeah, I'm not sure if we properly said to everyone who's watching, but you've really badly injured your shoulder. It. And... I, 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 fell off, I fell off a ladder. Uh, uh, I'd like to say I was snowboarding or uh, uh, bungee jumping or something, but I, I was um, uh, mending the pergola on a small step ladder. Oh. Uh, but I, I caught my arm as I, I, I fell on, on the rung of the ladder and it dislocated my shoulder and uh, but uh, um but the absurdity uh, the, yesterday i i was um indestructible mm. and today i'm fragile mm. uh, and uh, in, a, in a fortnight's time uh, um, i'll be a little bit better and uh, maybe in eight weeks time um i'll be back to indestructible again mm. There's a poem in that, for sure. Yeah. Well, there, there, hopefully there's a few poems. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how about, how about another poem? Let's hear the Department of Lost Wishes. Okay, no. um, here we go. £49.90, said the man with the clipboard. A full, a full refund, 
sign here. I don't understand, I said, a refund on what? £49.90, that's the total as far as our records show, he explained. We don't go back beyond decimalisation. Wishes made before that date come under a separate department. I see, I muttered, still not understanding. Did you say wishes? He tapped his pencil impatiently. It's all fully itemised, wishing wells, fountains, even the 20 pence you once tossed into a canal, pretending it to be magical. All refundable, just sign here. But I, I had hoped that someday the wishes might... Um, I began. He took a closer look at his clipboard and shook his head. I wasn't expecting, uh, I said, uh, feeling the need for some excuse. I was just, just open. £49.90, he offered. It's not the money, I said. I was just open. Do you want a refund or not? He insisted. I've got many people to see. I don't think I'll sign, I, I, I said. He made a note on his clipboard and turning to go, he grumbled. Just once I'd like a signature, just once. Absolutely brilliant. Henry, I think that might be my favorite of the poems you've heard so Is far. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's put tears to me eyes, huh? Um It's funny, I, I wrote that in my twenties as well. Mm. Um, I, I, I've, I've written about um, a thousand poems um, and um, some of them uh, are very um, uh, sort of uh, slight and witty and uh, you know sort of uh, Ogden Nash like if you like mm. um, but others um, there was a reason for writing them It's funny, isn't it, after 40 odd years that the reason's still there. Mm. It doesn't leave. Oh, I mean, this this poem really interests me because it's like the, the way that it's written, it feels like you're setting a scene and it, it's mm -hmm. like you're creating the parameters for a story or a show. And I, I wondered what's the difference to you? How do you? How do you know when something needs to be a poem and how do you know when something needs to be written for something like a TV show? Um, well, there's not a, a solid line between the two. And I think a, a lot of great TV shows are poetic. Um, I've just been watching um, uh, Mr. In Between, which is a, an Australian, um, uh, I suppose, dark comedy mm. um, about a, a killer. Uh, and uh, it's very matter of fact in the way that the Australians do working class, very matter of fact. Um, and uh, even though he kills people, um, you love him uh, and you cry. Mm. And I would say that in a lot of uh, drama, uh, you've got the, the essence of uh, poetry. For me, um, I'm always looking for the um, ambiguity in, in, in poetry. I think if, if I write a poem and, and it can only be interpreted one way uh, and it's sort of set in stone like uh, some sort of monolith, um, I, I find it wanes very quickly. Mm. So what, what I think I'm looking for is, is, is that um, trying to read it differently each time and, mm. and get a little more out of it. Yeah. Also, something that I wanted to pick up on, which I was thinking about with the poem before, The Jar of Joy, is how, I suppose, like whether you think that your poetry is on the whole quite optimistic or not, or if that's too simple of a word to <laughs> use, because I know that obviously that poem is very much thinking about the idea of joy, observing it, understanding it, um, and then thinking about this one and how it can, it feels so deeply sad at points. I wondered 
how it's, you it's think. Funny, it, it's funny, I, I wrote a, an article for Northern Soul uh, uh, last week um, because I had gone on um, uh, Amazon and I looked uh, uh, on my books and it, it, it tells you the rankings. So it'll say, of all the poetry books sold, it's uh, 1,754th. Uh, you know, best-selling poetry book, uh, and uh, and it made me laugh. Uh, um, uh, the, the, these rankings, uh, and then they put them under different categories. So one of my books was under uh, death and loss, uh, um, and another one of my books uh, was under travel companions because uh, um, uh, it's called traveling second class through hope. So obviously, somebody thought it was some sort of uh. travel. Book. Uh, um, and and uh, another one was under inspirational, uh, and it, it's funny because I would say that uh, that each of those books are uh, of a similar nature in terms of uh, optimism, pessimism, uh, uh, you know, w things that I'm going through, uh, and um, so in a way, you you can find. Uh, there's about 100 poems in each of my books. You, you can find um, all uh, manner of uh, emotion there. I, I've tried to record over the over, um, past 40 odd years um, a, um, a collection of different things rather than it be samey. Because if you, if you think about it, I don't want to bore myself. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, so if, if, if I think I'm using exactly the same words as I've used before, and I've got, I always show uh, uh, Angela and my sister, and uh, if you look on my um, uh, books, you'll see that uh, I, I, um, I thank a few people. Um, I've got a few people that, uh, school teachers and whatever, that I send the poems to. And I say, you know, tell, tell me, uh, um, you know, what you don't like about them. No, no good telling me what you like about them because, because you know, I'm not going to change that. Yeah. Uh, tell me what you don't like about them, and um, and so anything that's um, that's gone over old territory and uh, anything where I'm being a little bit lazy, I, I, I like to, um, you know, I, I like to sort of uh, keep moving uh, all the time. Um, my latest collection um, is called the Fire Hills. Um, because I, I moved out to, to where I am now in December, and I thought it'd be interesting um, with the landscape I've got here to to have a book which contains that landscape as opposed to the landscape of uh, Brighton, where I, I lived for 24 years. And um, and it's interesting the different words you, you use, but also um, we arrived in December, uh, so I was coming to terms with a new place in the middle of winter um, uh, and then uh, I've seen it blossom through spring and obviously we're, we're in summer now so that's been quite an experience and uh, I'd say for, for me one of the things is that um, you've got to want to read them uh, there's no point in me getting up on stage and going oh I don't want to read this that'd be rubbish wouldn't it yeah you'd be like a tribute band to yourself wouldn't you you yeah. know, like, like, like doing uh, you know stairway to heaven or something like that Mm. You know, because you did it 40 years ago and you can't be bothered <laughs> to think of something else. That's a very good point. Um, OK, we have just a couple more poems left to hear from you. So maybe let's hear um, let's hear this next one, which is Witness. Witness. So so this was uh, me going back to where uh, I was born and I was born in Nottingham. And um, so I have a great sense of home for Nottingham. Um, but where I was born has all been knocked down. So um, this is about that, it's called Witness. This is a tree that knows me. I played under its branches as a child. The weathered trunk may well be heavier, but these longer limbs can still embrace. Its shadow is stretched in the late afternoon. Though all around has been relabeled progress, it has set itself in this fickle landscape and reached an accommodation with the sky. Of course, the sun is the same sun, but it has no sense of loyalty. There is a commitment with a tree. This is an old friend that knew well those we've lost. When I'm gone, it will still know, and it will remember that I spoke of you. Oh, beautiful. That line, there is commitment with a tree, I think is wonderful. And this sort of 
says to me the when you've talked before about what home is and what home is to you and that personal element and how I feel like home is embedded in a history and this history of the tree that has lasted the test of it time. It is, and, and it could, because it's different for each of us, it, it's our history and, and, uh, and sometimes it's shared. And um, when, when they knocked down uh, the, the back-to-back housing in Nottingham where I was born, uh, they moved people to different council estates. Mm. So I, I never really got to keep in touch with anybody that was... Uh, um, uh, from where I was uh, actually born, apart from my own family. And um, so going back, seeing, um, so, I mean, e- even the cobble streets is all now tarmac. There was nothing there that bore any witness to any living person. And I walked across the road and there was a park I used to play on. Uh, and, uh, and because trees last a long time, yeah. there was a tree you know, by the um, uh, the uh, roundabout that was definitely there when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the poem's about that. And it was it, it's funny because because I recognised the tree and its position and, and uh, um, it was like an old friend. Mm. Oh, that is such a beautiful image that that was the thing that lasted and that's what informs the poem. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, um, yeah, I do. I do. Uh, I do like to. I remember going into uh, um, DFS once, uh, and I cried because there was sort of shit furniture. <laughs> and I, I thought, if you're going to chop a tree down, make some decent. That's so true. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I looked around and I thought, oh, these poor trees. I mean, you know, if you were that tree, you'd be embarrassed. That is really it's- true. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God, um, Henry. I mean, we'll we'll end on one more poem, but okay. before we end, I just have to say thank you so much for spending some time chatting with me and sharing your work. I've absolutely loved it. You've been a brilliant guest. Thank, thank you. It's been, been lovely, uh, and I, I hope uh, uh, people get to see it. Uh, yeah. And uh, as I say, um, um, you know, uh, do uh, use the poems in whatever way um, we can, really. Mm. Absolutely. Otherwise, I'm wasting my bloody time, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, do you want me to do the last poem? Yeah, go ahead. It's over to you. Okay. Th- so, thanks, thanks, everybody. Uh, um, uh, this is um, this is a poem I wrote about two weeks ago, and um, it's my son is autistic, uh, and uh, one of the great gifts he's given me is to live in the present because I've spent most of my life um, worrying about what I've done in the past and trying to put it right and make sure I don't mess up again. Uh, you know, obviously at the moment, my mind's going on, don't fall off a ladder. Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, um, and learn the lesson. Um, if I don't do any DIY, that's the lesson I've learned. Uh, um, the, the other thing I've, I've done is I've, I've always looked at the future and, 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 sort of try to uh, see how I can maximise and get the, the best out of it and head off danger and, and whatever. Um, so the, the, the actual living in the present, it comes third. Whereas my, my son, he doesn't have any of that. He just lives in the present. And, and therefore, when you're with him, it's no good you being in these other places. You have to be in the, in, in the present. Um, so it's uh, in the presence where the fun is. So um, I'm very indebted to it. So this is called Better Days. So thanks ever so much. Midwinter, we yearn for spring. Midnight, we look to the dawn. We hope for better days. We make plans for when we are stronger, when infection has passed, when the fracture is healed. We ready ourselves for the road ahead. We study to stand in good stead. We strive so at some stage we can rest. Yet even on the sunniest day, we prepare for the coming storm. We bide our time. We watch our step. We correct our course. We pray for someone or something to take us somewhere. 
somewhere better. We spend our whole lives searching for better days. And when we look back, there they were. We are the someone we prayed for. We are the something. This is the somewhere better. These are the better days. These are the better days. Time for new superheroes. Lightning Man, well, he's been on strike twice. It's time for solidarity and unity because Guy Fawkes, well, he's no longer shining bright. No more listening to riddles. No more listening to media cat calls. It's time to put an X on the ballot sheet to avenge all those in parliamentary halls. Time for you to be a superhero.